maybe I'll start with one or two questions, and maybe Elise has some questions, and then we'll do as yesterday, open the discussion to the audience. Um, I was wondering, Yuri, maybe I start with you. You just did your talk. Did you have any reaction once from one of the companies uh, you were dealing with in uh, in your works? Whatever reaction. Oh, um, uh, yeah, I was in the. I mean, the negotiations to get into the space, Pionian, took about two or three months of emailing back and forward, and they do have like quite a lot of transparency, so you can email. The CEO John Carlin, you know, di directly, and um, it was kind of always this. I think they did probably some background checks on me, but um, we discussed the work and my intentions for the work. Um, I mean, the the work is multi-layered, and there's a chat log that's superimposed on it that is a very subjective link, and it kind of forces the the viewer to like consider the text and the location of the text as perhaps two separate things or a sketch for something further. And I won't go into what that text is about because that's a different topic. But um, the, I think the reaction was that, like, was like a, of complete intrigue because it was, despite having like a huge amount of interest from architecture circles, there was no sort of interest from contemporary art. So we did have a lot of uh, discussions about my interest as an artist and also like sort of this revelation for them that there were artists making work about this stuff. Um, and I had a lot of sort of, while I only had a few hours in the space, I actually had a lot of conversations with the people doing server maintenance for instance. Um, and it's quite interesting because that particular, you can kind of tell the ethos of the company, that particular uh, data center they host quite a lot of people who have hacking interests. So quickly the discussions led to, led to things that were sort of quasi-legal, um, which, was, which was interesting in itself. It was quite, quite a strange experience. Um, and as I said, it's, like, it's an underground data center, so it kind of, it has this sort of other world quality to it as well. And maybe a question for, for you, Paul. Um, very naive question, but isn't the action of encrypting, let's say, an email, I want to send an email and I encrypt it, the very best way to, in a way, attract att attention to that email that maybe wouldn't have been uh, seen by everybody, no? It's, it's good that it's such a naive question, but I mean, to put it very simply, um, if, if you want to send a letter, you will, you will uh, you know, lick it and close it, um, just as a very simple means of I don't know, sending a love letter, sending something else. Otherwise, the way that we send emails nowadays, if they're unencrypted, it's basically just screaming very loudly what you have to say so everyone can hear it. Everyone has access to what you're saying. So the idea or this sort of common notion that many, many people have, like I have nothing to hide, is complete and utter bullshit, to be honest. It's not about that you have anything to hide. It's about you know, controlling yourself what kind of information you want to share with whom. So encryption shouldn't be something that is attracting attention um, or anything, but it should be a standard protocol. As probably 99% of people don't encrypt their message, doesn't the I don't know, CIA think, okay, let's check on those who encrypt, but they really might have interesting stuff. But they can check all they want. If it's encrypted, they will not see it. <laughs> Um, I mean, it relates quite interestingly to the transparency of the RELCOM network, which is sort of pre-PGP. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, everyone using that network knew that the conversations were completely visible to everyone. So you do have this amazing thing of really personal aspects of people following up and asking about, like, how, how relatives are, or how certain people are, friends are, during the coup. But everyone knew that this, these, ne these messages were transparent and viewable to everyone. And I guess that's the situation you have now is how will this data be treated going forward? I mean, maybe the, the, in the post sort of NSA revelations, there's a backlash or maybe, you know, maybe artists sort of 20 years from now will be recycling people's emails that they've hacked. I don't know. Yeah, actually I actually have a comment. I'm not sure it's going to become a, a question, but to you, to you both, um, I think it's interesting 
that we kind of agree that there is this general misconception that um, in both your um, presentation we're talking about something cryptic and immaterial when we address new technologies and now we can see that it's absolutely not. But I'm not really a fan of conspiracy theory, but I'm wondering why we have this general idea that, for example, cryptography is just impossible to access, although as you just said, it's very simple. Those are tools that we have easily access to. And, and from there, I just want to kind of jump to this idea of representation. As you said, a cloud is, is not a cloud, right? It's actually a room with servers and data stored. But I, it's, I think it's funny that this kind of simplified representation is also applied, for example, to this bunker, you know, the image of the bunker that is heavily photoshopped so people can imagine this kind of sci-fi aesthetic so we can imagine still, you know, f you know for, for bad or good purpose, be it like government, like, Corp, corp, like big corporation purposes or hackers, we always, always find those super simplified images of where information is stored. And I'm wondering if you have an idea why. Well, I mean, I think, um, I mean, yeah, the, with cyber bunkers, their tactics are really interesting and equally the, with Bahnhof and their very expensive data center you know, which, you know, referencing science fiction is also, also an interesting example. I think the reason is, the reality is working with this stuff is actually, it's very exciting for these people, but to depict it is incredibly boring. And I think these people got into, like with Bahnhof, I noticed that the reason there's references to science fiction to kind of make it more alluring and to promote it is because they, these guys have a genuine interest why they got into technology is through science fiction. You have these like feedback loops. Um, and I think it's actually, the, though it's simplified, I think it's actually a useful metaphor to use at this point in time. Because the reality of this, I mean, I, I've, that's why I've been using uh, servers within my work, because they are sort of quite they appear as quite crude devices. They actually are quite disappointing. And when you display them within the space, people are like, oh, so that's, that's the internet. And I guess like, may maybe we do need to face the, I guess the um, banality of the whole thing. Maybe that's the point, I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, to, to come back to your, uh, to the word conspiracy theories, I mean, ever since, you know, it was not, and we know that it's not, and it's, I find it incredibly naive still that in, there's a text from the, a newspaper article from 1986 of my teacher Friedrich Kittler about the NSA. And um, so it's, it's really every time um, a large enough network is established and it can be a postal system, it can be a telegraphic system, it's clear who is doing it. It's the governments, it's uh, the big institutions, it's mm -hmm. the military and it's the corporations. And of course, they have complete control over the network that they're using. So the internet uh, was built by the American military. So of course, they have access to everything. I mean, it's, it's incredibly naive to think they don't. So um, that's what I was saying about the internet sort of coming of age. It's time that, that, uh, that there, we, we reach a certain degree of literacy. It's not about being paranoid. This is not about hiding anything. It's just about having control of what you're doing. It's very simple. Yeah, it's a really the technology is either a matter of uh, military advance or Apple that makes thinner computers with smaller uh, hard disk, hard drives, so you have to use uh, cloud and give your information and give your data and uh, have uh, big data and so on. I think one of the problems is that the, that the, the simpler and sort of slicker our tools get, the more inaccessible and in in transparent they become. Um, sooner or later, I think in the next five to ten years, the gadgets will start to disappear completely and become at least seemingly immaterial. You will have a contact lens like Google Glass displaying uh, your smartphone contact. You, you will have implants sooner or later. But in the way that the gadgets will disappear, they ultimately become the actual black box. That's what I uh, think that as long as you have something that you can open up, you can um, work with the technology, you can work with the software and the hardware, which you should do, um, then you actually have control of, of what you're doing. 
And that's something that has become, and I find it very, I mean, I find it hilarious that it's really actually a result of sort of an aesthetic choice of computer scientists' PowerPoint presentations that we have this thing called cloud computing. But um, we also have to take into account all the power structures and labor structures, but also the immense um, geological and biological impact that computing has on our world. This is, uh, I mean, the, the energy consumption, the, the waste, um, the rare earth mining, which is something that, that is creating a new form of colonial economy in, in, um, in Africa. Um, and the way that uh, climate, like the climate is affected by the huge amounts of heat that data centers produce um, is something that we haven't even started to talk about uh, today. Yeah, we talked about uh, Wikipedia uh, yesterday. It's, it's true, even when you do a Google search, it's, it's terrible how much uh, energy you use. But for Wikipedia, it's the same as the fifth or the sixth website. So. Well, um, I was wondering, I don't know, are there some questions in the audience? Yes, there are, because uh, Yuri has to leave in about six or seven, five minutes. No. Uh, the question would be, uh, how long does uh, governmental uh, institution like the NSA would take to decipher an email? How long does it take? Um, that's a bit hard to say because, I mean, if, if there is no backdoor in crypto algorithms used in public key cryptography, so if they actually have to go through the motions and they use um, current technology, I would say maybe a couple of hundred years, um, if the algorithm works. I mean, there, has been boom, there have been rumors about um, possi the possibility of a backdoor in these systems, because uh, that's what the LDs have been trying to in install one. And then there's the question of computing technology. With, with current computing technologies, uh, PGP algorithm still takes uh, probably 100 or 200 years or longer if it's strong enough. That's wrong. Thank you. Um, you said something like, place magic by nature and I, I didn't really get this ah. idea or how you because I think there's some yeah. some interesting connections also when we we saw like the background picture that showed some romantic um, scenery yeah. of nature landscape well I think what I, I, it was about this Isaac Asimov quote he said any uh, this uh, any sufficiently advanced um, technology or form of science is indis indistinguishable from magic, but we could also say that any form of sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from nature. And I think this is, uh, this is a convergence point that we are slowly coming to that technologies become evolutionary in a way that um, they, they will sooner or later grow like plants. You know? So technology in the way that it's already become a part of nature and there, there's lots of interesting theories in sort of media ecology theory and Timothy Mountain stuff that says that of course we are with the Anthropocene, we are post nature. There is no nature anymore. There's actually not a, there's no divide anymore between nature and technology because um, we have left such a strong imprint from carbon emissions to the way that we riddle the planet with cables or whatever or you know, pollute the atmosphere. Um, with Wi-Fi signals that um, seem to be material but are not. So that's, that's what I meant actually by this, uh, by this way of um, technology becoming something natural. Some other questions? Otherwise, I have a question for you, Yuri Patterson, um, just about the, um, the pictures we saw of the show in Warsaw and the piece you presented there, I think, uh, Sculpture and Digital Work, was it the title? Or the uh, um, familiarity brief contemporary. Okay, sorry. Uh, could you just uh, come back a bit about that work that uh, I found very interesting, but maybe um, 
it wasn't presented uh, in depth enough. And I have also a question about the, the, the formal aspect of it and how, how much it is important and uh, for you working also on, on various uh, levels. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I have, I've had like a, a long-standing interest in sort of self-hosting uh, work and self-hosting data. So like when I started making work online, I began to get very frustrated by sort of this nonchalance with sort of like you just put up a website, it's very easy, and there's sort of no aftercare beyond that. So I began hosting doing sort of simple hosting at home. I used a Raspberry Pi and hosted my own website through my home connection connected to my Wi-Fi router. And this became a tactic also for me to avoid using services like Dropbox. Um, so this developed, this interest developed in me want, wanting to get brush up on my skills on uh, server, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess uh, server configuration. And um, I ended up buying two former Google search appliance servers. These are servers that are seal boxes that you can buy that contain Google search algorithm. And you, they're quite expensive. I think they range between three and four and a half thousand dollars for quite a simple server. Um, but you point them at your documents within an um, institution, so a university, that kind of thing. And it indexes them in the same way that search on the web, Google the search on the web. Um, I was sort of doing a lot of research on the people have drawn parallels to how Google itself is a scraper site. So Google outlaws scraper sites, sites that troll the database on keywords, steal the information and often alter it or spin it using sort of AI or multiple translations to then get higher search ranks. Um, the reason that this is done is to sort of become the top website for that keyword within Google search results. So I was interested in those tactics of these rogue websites, um, while at the same time I was interested in the relationship with, with those websites in Google, I was interested in the relationship between Google, the government, and acts like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, where Google actively removed content from search and sort of censor searches. So you're not getting an accurate results when you search using Google. So I wanted to kind of create a work that mirrors Google's tactics, um, searches based on my keywords, uses some of their hardware, and it also presents the hardware as the physical work. The digital work is accessible and it sort of relates to our, I guess, our connection with the network, how we most use the internet is usually on mobile devices. So I wanted users within the space to engage with the work in that way, to be sort of prompted to enter public IP address of the institution and then sort of be present with the data in the room. And these sort of boxes are kind of very, very sort of noisy objects. They sort of have heavy fan noise, blinking lights. They're kind of quite omnipresent within the space. So I kind of wanted to also create that environment where people were scrolling through this, this website of, I guess, flattened and stolen sort of quite arbitrary content. Oh, and oh, sorry, the last point is the, the uh, Pirate Bay image I used, I applied that to the server. So it's kind of the, there's a lot about like the corporate companies using the color blue, and I saw Google as being sort of the sea of Google blue with these sort of islands of communities of opposition within that. So that Pirate Bay image of the island has been placed on this sort of wider map. So I guess formally it also has those elements. It sort of represents a map within the space. I saw one hand, and maybe it's the last question. Is it okay? It's yep. last. Should be fine, yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you very much for both your talks, very good. Um, I have a question to Yuri. When you say bunker, I have an association of uh, war and maybe of Untergang or downfall, as we see in many movies. But when you show an image, um, of a ca cabled cave, which you did, I have different associations and I want to ask you which is your proposition in those. Is it more that we are still in the prehistoric ages of uh, digital world or 
is it a more um, apocalyptic uh, thing that you're showing us that um, we are going back to the cave? <laughs> well, I think the, there's, I presented two bunkers and I guess one sea fort and the, the bunker in Stockholm is, is built in a, a cave um, underneath sort of a, what they call White Mountain in Stockholm. It's like very central to the city centre. But the cave pre was pre-existing and then they turned it into a nuclear bunker to protect the, the uh, higher up members of state if there was a nuclear war. So the, the space serves the same purpose as the uh, above ground bunker, um, cyber bunker. So, I mean, I think the, there are those analogies of, I guess, I guess that is sort of, sort of a primeval um, urge to bury what is valuable. And I think Van Hoff are tapping into that quite a bit. But in many ways, these are kind of the practical considerations of reusing these spaces by, and sort of reformatting these spaces by these data centers. It's more to do with those. And it's sort of, I'm less drawing any sort of analogies of my own on that beyond it. So come back to the materiality of it, I think it's also important to point out that these bunker structures have the possibility of disconnection. So data security in terms of being able to also this means being able to disconnect from the internet and uh, to create a structure that is also um, protected against natural influences or an EMP attack or something like this. So there, there are ways, of, uh, ele an electromagnetic pulse, for example. So there are ways, I mean, this is still, it's still quite crappy hardware, you know? You can, if you beat it or if you uh, put a magnet on it or some heat, it's gonna break. So this, this is also a reason why, why we put it in a bunker. Thank you very much, Yuri Fatison. Thank you very much, Paul Feigerfeld.